Disablement, Oppression, and the Political Economy by Marta Russell. Any movement for social equality or freedom from oppression has something in common with Marxism. In liberal capitalist economies, such social movements often consist of reform efforts to enact civil and human rights legislation. The very perception that there is a need for legal rights to protect marginal classes of persons suggests that oppression exists. For if members of a particular group were not oppressed, they would not have barriers to remove nor rights to be gained. Marxists identify structural injustices that need rectifying and seek to change society through action. From here, however, Marxism parts ways with, the, with traditional liberalism. Liberal solutions, Marx would argue, must fall short of remedying oppression because liberalism fails to acknowledge the central role of productive activities in labor relations in history. Specifically, liberalism fails to expose either the way society is organized for the production of the material conditions of its, of its existence, or that the mode of production plays the chief causal role in determining oppressive social outcomes. Marxism posits the principal motive for historical change is the struggle among social classes over their corresponding shares in the harvest of production. Eh. With respect to the social condition of disablement, the focus is on the struggle of the class of disabled persons for the right to enter the labor force and on the place the disabled body occupies within the political economy of capitalism. The term disabled is used to designate the socioeconomic disadvantages imposed on top of a physical or mental impairment. Bypassing biological or physical anthropological definitions that make it appear that impaired persons are naturally and therefore justifiably excluded from the labor force, or that one is handicapped by ableist biases reflected in the physical environment. This article takes the view that disability is a socially created category derived from labor relations. For this reason, disabled persons is the nomenclature of choice rather than people with disabilities. Disabled is used to classify persons deemed less exploitable or not exploitable by the owning class who control the means of production in a capitalist economy. This article presents an overview of Marxism from the theory of labor power relations to capitalism's role in defining disability to show that our economic system produces the state of disablement and that the prevailing rate of exploitation of labor determines who is considered disabled, disabled and who is not. The article then explains how class interests, interests perpetuate the exclusion of disabled persons and others from the workforce through systemic compulsory, compulsory unemployment. Disability is conceptualized as a product of the exploitative economic structure of capitalist society, one that creates the so-called disabled body to permit a small capitalist class to create the economic conditions necessary to accumulate vast wealth. The primacy of production, profits, and the non-conforming body. The man who possesses no other property than his labor power must, in all conditions of society and culture, be the slave of other men who have made themselves the owners of the material conditions of labor. He can only work with their permission, hence live only with their permission. Uh, that's a quotation from Karl Marx, uh, Critique of the Gotha Program. Marx's most significant contribution to history was to pinpoint the primary cause of oppression as economic. The capitalist class exploits the working masses, wage earners, for profit to the detriment alienation of the working class. Private property relations entail an exploiting owning class that lives off the surpluses produced by an exploited non-owning and thus oppressed class. Feudal and slave-based modes of production also had exploitative relations of production, though different than those of capitalism. The surpluses are extracted by different methods in capitalism, feudalism, and slavery. Exploitation in strict Marxist terms refers to the appropriation of surplus value through the wage relationship. 
A primary basis of oppression of disabled persons, those who could work with accommodations, is their exclusion from exploitation as wage laborers. Studies show that disabled persons experience lower labor force participation rates, higher unemployment rates, and higher part-time employment rates than non-disabled persons. In the United States, more than two-thirds of working-age disabled adults say they would prefer to work. The U.S. Current Population Survey suggests that in 1998, only 30.4% of those with a work disability between ages 16 and 64 were in the labor force whereas 82.3% of same-age non-disabled persons were either employed or actively seeking work for pay. Only 26.6% of those with work disabilities were employed, compared with 78.4% of non-disabled persons. The struggle for integration into mainstream employment is one key to ameliorating disabled persons' social impoverishment. It has been widely assumed that civil rights law laws that prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of impairment would produce the desired results. But 10 years after passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, despite a growing U.S. economy and a low aggregate official national unemployment rate, 4%, the unemployment rate for the working age disabled population has barely budged from its chronic state of 65% to 71%. According to a recent study, although many Americans reaped higher incomes from an economy that created a record number of new jobs during seven years of continuous economic growth, 1992 to 1998, the employment rates of disabled men and women continued to fall so that by 1998, they were still below the 1992 level. Despite the hopes of civil rights proponents, it cannot be stated with any certainty that the ADA has drawn disabled persons into the labor force. To the contrary, studies show that civil rights laws have not produced the gains in, in employment levels, wage rates, or employment opportunities for disabled people that advocates expected. Census data confirms there has been no improvement in the economic well-being of disabled persons since Since, since passage of the ADA. In 1989, 28.9% of working age adults with disabilities lived in poverty. In 1994, the figure climbed slightly to 30%. Some scholars suggest the law is a compromise that is failing and least likely to help those workers with disabilities who are most disadvantaged in the labor market. Historical materialism provides a theoretical basis from which to explain these conditions and outcomes. A class analysis makes apparent that it is neither accident nor result of the natural order of things that disabled persons rank at the bottom of the economic ladder. Capitalism has certain advantages or certain disadvantages, such as persistent vast inequalities. A chief disadvantage is that many people are unemployed, underemployed, and impoverished against their will. Although capitalism has sometimes held the promise of expanding the base of people benefiting from it, for disabled persons, it largely has been an exclusionary system. Economic historians such as Carl Polanyi and E.P. Thompson have pointed out that capitalist beginnings required a major change in the concept of human labor. The effects on the disabled population can be explained by tracing how work evolved under capitalism. In pre-capitalist societies, economic exploitation made possible by the feudal concentration of land ownership was direct and political. Although a few owners reaped the surplus, the many living on an estate worked for subsistence. With the advent of capitalism, the discipline of labor was now economic, not political. The worker was free in the double sense that he or she was no longer tried to or tied to a given manner and had the right to choose between work and death. Under Marx's labor theory of value, the basis of capitalist accumulation is the concept of surplus labor value. The worker's ability to work, Marx calls this labor power, is sold to the capitalist in return for a wage. 
If the worker produced an amount of value equivalent only to her wage, there would be nothing left over for the capitalist and no reason to hire the worker. But because labor power has the capacity to, to produce more value than its own wages, the worker can be made to work longer than the labor time equivalent of the wage received. The amount of labor time that the worker works to produce value equivalent to his wage, Marx calls necessary labor. The additional labor time that the worker works beyond this, Marx calls surplus labor, and the value it produces, he calls surplus value. The capitalist appropriates the surplus value as a source of self or as a source of profits. So writes Marx, the secret of, of the self-expansion of capital of profit resolves itself into having the disposal of a definite quality of other people's unpaid labor. To Descartes, the body was a machine. To the industrialist, individuals' bodies were valued for their ability to function like machines. As human beings were gathered into the satanic mills to accomplish the task of capital accumulation, impediments were erected to disabled people's survival. New enforced factory discipline, timekeeping, and production norms worked against a slower, more self-determined and flexible work pattern into which many handicapped people had been integrated. Non-disabled workers had value because bosses could push them to produce at ever-increasing rates of speed and generate higher profits. But as work became more rationalized, requiring precise mechanical movements of the body repeated in quicker succession, impaired persons, deaf, blind, mentally, mentally impaired, those with mobility difficulties, were seen as less fit to do the tasks required of factory workers. They were increasingly excluded from paid employment on the grounds that they were unable to keep pace with the disciplinary power of the new mechanized factory-based production system. So it was that the operation of the labor market in, in the 19th century effectively depressed handicapped people of all kinds to the bottom of the market. Whether one accepts Marx's labor theory of value or not, it undeniably it undeniably explains the historical social basis by which the commodity society turned labor power itself into a commodity. Industrial capitalism created both a class of proletarians and a class of disabled who did not conform to the standard worker body and whose labor power was effectively ignored. A market-driven society meant that disabled persons perceived to be less to be of less use to the competitive profit cycle were excluded from work. As a result, disabled persons came to be regarded as a social problem, and the justification emerged for segregating individuals with impairments from mainstream life and into a variety of institutions, including workhouses, asylums, prisons, colonies, and special schools. Reproducing disablement. Despite the availability of, of advanced assistive technology and an information age economy that has expanded the realm of jobs disabled persons could readily perform, body politics under, under standard business practice are still a part of the employment struggle of disabled persons today. Economic discrimination, the structural mechanisms that permit and even encourage a system or a systemic di discrimination against disabled workers has not been fully confronted. Productive labor under capitalism refers to the production of surplus value near or above the prevailing rate of exploitation. Because the material basis of capitalist accumulation is the mining of surplus labor from the workforce, the owners and managers of the businesses necessarily have to discriminate against those workers whose impairments add to the cost of production. Expenses to accommodate disabled persons in the workplace will be resisted as an addition to the fixed capital portion of constant capital. In effect, the prevailing rate of exploitation determines who is disabled and who is not. The U.S. Civil Rights Commission states that one of the most persistent criticisms of the ADA has been the issue of oops, how much it costs employers to comply with the employment provisions. Such business 
Ob objections reveal labor market mechanisms that generate obstacles to employment of disabled persons. Any executive knows that employer capitalist will resist any extraordinary cost of doing business. For example, a leading economist in the law and economics movement, Richard Epstein, states that the employment provisions of the ADA are a disguised subsidy and that successful enforcement under the guise of reasonable accommodation necessarily impedes the operation and efficiency of firms. Whether actual or falsely projected in any given instance, employers continue to express concerns about increased costs in the form of providing accommodations, anticipate extra administration costs when hiring non-standard workers, and speculate that a disabled employee may increase workers' compensation costs in the future. Employers, if they provide health care insurance at all, anticipate elevated premium costs for disabled workers. Insurance companies and managed care health networks often exempt pre-existing conditions from coverage or make other coverage exclusions based on chronic conditions, charging extremely high premiums for the person with a history of such health care needs. Employers in turn tend to look for ways to avoid providing coverage to cut costs. In addition, employers typically assume that they will encounter increased liability and lower productivity from a disabled worker. Disabled workers face inherent economic discrimination with the capitalist or within the capitalist system, stemming from employers' expectations of encountering additional non-standard production costs when hiring or retaining a non-standard disabled worker as opposed to a standard non-disabled worker. Oh, with no need for accommodation, interpreters, environmental modifications, liability insurance, maximum health care coverage, inclusive of attendant services, or even health care coverage at all. The category of disabled as applied to the labor market is a social creation. Business practices determine who has a job and who does not. An employee who is too, cost too costly due to a significant impairment will not likely become or remain an employee. Census data tends to to support this view. For working, for working age persons with no disability, the likelihood of having a job is 82.1%. For people with a non-severe disability, the rate is 76.9%. The rate drops to 26.1% for those with a significant disability. According to, according to the 2001 National Organization on Disability, Harris Survey, employment rates are 19% for those with a severe disability. 51% for those moderately disabled, and 32% for those with any disability. Data from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, suggests a strong relationship between disability onset and employer firings. The most prevalent cause of complaints disabled workers file with the EEOC are over involuntary termination of employment upon disablement. Of the, 1, 000, or of the 171,669 employment discrimination charges filed with the EEOC for the period of July 26, 1992 through February 28, 1998, 53.7% involved the issue of discharge and another 32% involved the failure to provide reasonable accommodation. The ADA itself explicitly states that employers are not required to provide an accommodation if it would impose an under hardship or an undue hardship on the business. The disabled person's theoretical right to an accommodation is really no right at all. It is dependent upon the employer's calculus. Managers and owners in general have only tolerated the use of disabled workers when they could save on the variable portion of cost of production, resulting in lower wages for workers. The sheltered workshop is the prototype for justifying below minimum wages for disabled people, based on the theory that such workers are not able to keep up with the average widget sorter. According to the Washington Post, 6,300 such U.S. workshops employ more than 391,000 disabled workers, some paying 20% to 30% of the minimum wage, as little as $3.26 an hour and $11 per week.
Census Bureau findings substantiate that disabled workers pay in the regular labor market also fall to the low end of the wage scale. In 1995, disabled workers holding part-time jobs in the private market earned on average only 72.4% of the amount non-disabled workers earned annually. Such wage differentials were also observed for those working full-time. Median monthly income for people with work disabilities averaged about $1,511 for women and $1,880 for men as much as 20% less than the $1,737 to $2,356 earned by their non-disabled counterparts. Over a lifetime, this disparity in earnings represent tens of thousands of dollars lost to disabled workers and pocketed by business. In liberal capitalist economies, redistributionist laws like the ADA are necessarily in tension with business class interests which resist such cost-shifting burdens. Representatives of small and medium businesses, such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the American Banking Association, and the National Federation of Independent Business, oppose the ADA. Supply-side economist Paul Craig Roberts warned on the day the act was signed that it would add enormous costs to businesses that will cut into their profits. Writing for the Seventh Circuit in 1995, Judge Richard Posner, a self-appointed protector of the interests of business, released the business schematic of cost-benefit analysis to the ADA. If the nation's employers have potentially unlimited financial obligations to 43 million disabled persons, the Americans with Disabilities Act will, imp will have imposed an indirect tax potentially greater than the national debt. We do not find an intention to bring about such a radical result in either the language of the act or its history. The preamble actually markets the act as a cost saver, pointing to billions of dollars in unnecessary expenses resulting from dependency and non-productivity. The savings will be illusory if employers are required to expend many more billions in accommodation then will be saved by enabling disabled people to work. Marxian political economy tells us that disability oppression has less to do with prejudicial attitudes than with an accountant's calculation of the present cost of production versus the potential benefits to the future rate of exploitation. Discrimination can be ameliorated but not eliminated by changing attitudes. Only a system of material production that takes into account the human consequences of its development can eliminate discrimination against disabled persons. Surplus population, compulsory unemployment, and the reserve army of labor. Other oppressive forces erecting obstacles to the employment of the disabled population relate to compulsory unemployment in a capitalist economy. Under Marx's general law of capitalist accumulation, unemployment is not an aberration of capitalism, but a built-in component of the market economy. The surplus population or reserve army of labor includes the official unemployed and all those parts of the population, whether part of the workforce at a given time or not, who might become part of the workforce if the demand for them grew. Marx explains that the business cycle depends on the constant formation, the greater or lesser absorption, and the reformation of the industrial reserve army or surplus population because the economic system dictates that larger numbers of workers must be seeking work then employers will never recruit. As touched upon earlier, disabled people were driven to the bottom of the labor pool by early dynamics of capitalist industrial production. Marx recognized this effect. He included in the stagnant surplus population impaired persons least likely to be, to be employed. But now that disabled persons could work with an accommodation as called for by the ADA, there's at least the potential that this stagnant group of would-be workers may join the active reserve army of labor. There are many factors that affect the reserve army of labor. Some of them, like the detailed division of labor and mechanization internal to the process of capital accumulation and the manipulation of credit availability by the U.S. Federal Reserve System,
are intentional mechanisms of state policy. This section of the article focuses on the role of the state in augmenting the reserve army through monetary policy. U.S. monetary policy is carried out by the Federal Reserve, a system of quasi-independent banks, overseen by a board of governors appointed by the president, affects interest rates and illustrates how U.S. capitalism preserves the reserve army of labor. The reserve army is actually much larger than the officially unemployed. For example, the Bureau of Labor Statistics put official unemployment at 6.4 million in April of 2001. But another 3.2 million people work part-time because they cannot find a full-time job. And 4.4 million who need jobs are not counted because they gave up looking. The real jobless rate is closer to 14 million, or 9.6% of the labor force, more than twice the official rate. According to mainstream U.S. economists, large numbers of people are left jobless because a threshold of unemployment is necessary to avoid inflation and maintain the health of the American economy. The theory of a natural rate of unemployment or non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, NAR or NAIRU, has dominated macroeconomics for about 25 years. The Full Employment and and Balanced Growth Act of 1978, the Humphrey Hawkins Act, mandates that the Federal Reserve Bank promote full employment, but the Federal Reserve connects low unemployment with inflation in disregard of the Humphrey Hawkins Act. Since the 1970s, the Federal Reserve has instead assumed the task of fighting inflation by raising interest rates, slowing economic growth, and keeping employment in check. There are central bankers who reject the NAIRU theory, and these have adopted the Taylor Rule, making their anchor of economic policy the sustainable rate of growth. Under this theory, growth becomes unsustainable when unemployment gets below 3%. Under either theory, mainstream economic policymakers assume the need for a reserve army of labor holding that at least 3% to 6% of the population must be unemployed at all times. Underlying the Federal Reserve's steering is a ratio between employment and unemployment, or enlarging the active reserve army of labor, is its desire to regulate wages. Marx explains, Wages are not determined by the variations of the absolute numbers of the working population, but by the varying proportions in which the working class is divided, into an active army and a reserve army by the increase or diminution in the relative amount of surplus population by the extent to which it is alternately absorbed and set free. Tight labor markets or a labor shortage means a smaller active reserve army and greater pressure for wage increases from labor. As unemployment goes down, labor costs go up because workers are more secure to press for wage increases. Before Marx, Adam Smith observed such a mechanism and originated the truism that the power relationship between workers and capitalists changes with the the employment rate. Smith wrote, The scarcity of hands occasions a competition among masters who bid against one another in order to get workmen and thus voluntarily break through the natural combination of masters to not raise wages. A shortage of labor forces capitalists to raise wages. Two mainstream economists, David Blanche Flower and Andrew Oswald, have produced evidence that all things being equal, unemployment depresses wages. Economist James Galbraith has also shown that power, and particularly market or monopoly power, changes with the general level of demand, the rate of growth, and the rate of unemployment. He explains that in periods of high employment, the weak gain ground on the strong. In periods of high unemployment, the strong gain ground on the weak. Unemployment rates are the outgrowth of class struggle over the distribution of income and political power. Even Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, admits a class relationship. A primary purpose of U.S. monetary policy is to keep wages down. So in terms of the political economy, enlarging the active reserve army of labor is good for business because having more people desperate for work keeps competition for jobs high and workers' wages down, thereby protecting profit margins that are sacred to the interests of capital.
This explains in part why the government in the recent tight labor market has ended the entitlement to welfare for millions of women who are now forced into the, into the labor market and why it has taken an interest in promoting the employment of disabled persons, a group whose employment needs have historically been rejected. As the available reserve army gets depleted, there is a need for more persons to join the labor pool to keep wages in check. How many disabled persons are there to potentially join the active reserve army? The Economic and Social Research Institute finds 2.3 million unemployed disabled people could be working with accommodations, but this appears to underestimate the disabled reserve army. There are 17 million working age disabled persons, 5.2 million of whom are working. This leaves 11.8 Uh, this leaves 11.8 million either officially unemployed or not in the labor force. Seven out of 10 disabled persons age 16 to 64 who are not employed say that they would prefer to be working. Thus, as many as 8.3 million workers could be enlisted in the active reserve army. Furthermore, there are indications that disabled persons may be significantly underemployed, preferring to work full time when they are only employed part time. Between 1981 and 1993, the proportion of disabled persons working full-time declined by 8%, while the number, working, while the number of working part-time for both economic and non-economic reasons increased disproportionately. Significantly, there is a large pool of disabled persons to utilize as buffers against higher wages and lower profits. Disabled persons, however, are the last class of persons seeking the right to enter the workforce at a time when unemployment levels are the lowest they have been in nearly 40 years and may be below what the investor class traditionally will tolerate. As such, the employment expectations of disabled persons are likely to outstrip material gains due to the limits economic policymakers place on growth. As Marx explains, the reserve army belongs to capital as if the latter had bred it a mass of human material always ready for explo exploitation. The stagnant categories being the most disposable can be rendered superfluous at the slightest downturn of the business cycle. By design then, the US economy imposes compulsory unemployment on millions of people and fails to meet their material needs with the disabled population, the least employed at the bottom of the labor pool. Class interests regulating the labor supply and disability policy. It is often claimed that disabled persons are invisible, disregarded by mainstream society, and irrelevant to the workings of society. This analysis has attempted to explain that the unemployables have been deliberately shut out of the labor force due to a capitalist economy that so far has dictated their exclusion by measure of economic calculations that favor the business class. It further posits that disabled persons are further oppressed in capitalist societies by having been purposely shifted onto social welfare or segregated into institutions for similar reasons. To keep workers who could not be profitably employed out of the mainstream workforce, but also to exert social control over the entire labor supply. Marx explains that capitalism is a system of forced labor, no matter how much it may seem to result from free contractual agreement. It is a coercion, because capitalists own the means of production and laborers do not. Without ownership of factories and other means of production, workers lack their own access to the means of making a livelihood. By this very fact, workers are compelled to sell their labor to capitalists for a wage because the alternative is homelessness or starvation or both. Deborah Stone in The Disabled State convincingly argues that in order to restructure the workforce for the demands of early capitalist production, it was first necessary to eradicate all viable alternatives to wage labor for the mass population. Labor is a resource to be manipulated like capital and land. Stone writes, the disability concept was essential to the development of an exploitable workforce in early capitalism and remains indispensable as an instrument of the state in controlling labor supply.
Regulating the composition of the labor force through social policy became key to ensuring an ongoing exploitable labor supply. Disability became an important boundary or an important boundary category through which persons were allocated to either the either the oops, based or needs-based system of distribution. In the United States, disability came to be defined explicitly in relation to the labor market. For instance, in some workers' compensation statutes, a laborer's body is rated by impairment according to its, fun its functioning parts. In social security law, disabled means medically unable to engage in work activity. Our institutions, particularly medical and social welfare institutions, have historically held disablement to be an individual problem, not the result of economic or social forces. They have equated disability with physiological, anatomical, or mental defects, and hegemoni- <laughs> hegemon <laughs> I fucking hate this word. Hegem hegemonically? <laughs> How these conditions responsible for the disabled person's lack of full participation in the economic life of our society. This approach presumed a biological inferiority of disabled persons, pathologizing characteristics such as blindness, deafness, and physical and mental physical physical and mental physical impairments that have naturally appeared in the human race throughout history became a means of social control that has relegated disabled persons to isolation and exclusion from society. By placing the focus on curing the so-called abnormality and segregating the incurables into the administrative category of disabled, medicine bolstered the capitalist business interest to shove less exploitable workers with impairments out of the workforce. This exclusion was rationalized by social Darwinists who used biology to argue that heredity, race and disability status, prevailed over the class and economic issues raised by Marx and others. Such as the inferior weren't meant to survive in nature, they weren't meant to survive in a competitive society. For 19th century tycoons, social Darwinism proved a marvelous rationale for leaving the surplus population to die in poverty. Capitalism set up production dynamics that devalued less exploitable or non-exploitable bodies and social Darwinism theorized their disposability. If it was natural that disabled persons were not to survive, then the capitalist class was off the hook to design a more equitable economic system, one that would accommodate the body that did not conform to the standard worker body driven to labor for owning class profit. Social analysts describe the disability needs-based system as a privilege because as an administrative category, it carries with it permission to be exempt from the work-based system. In conservative terms, disability can be described as an essential part of the moral economy. In the public debate over redistribution of societal resources, public assistance is viewed as legitimate for those deemed unable to work. But the disabled individuals on public benefits under US capitalism do not have any objective right to a decent standard of living even with privileged status, nor is the definition of disability etched in stone. As Stone pointed out, the definition of disability is flexible. The state, which evaluates disability status, controls the labor supply by expanding or contracting the numbers of persons who qualify as disabled, often for political and economic reasons. Neither privilege nor morality theories adequately describe the function of the needs-based system. A political economy analyst would ask what role do public disability benefits play to further the machinations of production and wealth accumulation? The vast majority of those in Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, the deserving workers involuntarily severed from their wages are not privileged. They are financially oppressed by less than adequate aid Public disability benefits hover at what is determined in an official poverty level. In 2000, the Department of Health and Human Services set the poverty threshold for one at $8,350 because $759 was the average per month benefit that a disabled worker received from SSDI 
and $373 was the average federal income for the needs-based Supplemental Security Income, SSI. The annual income of more than 10 million disabled persons on these programs was between $4,000 and $10,000 a year, or that year. The extremely low SSI benefit was set up for those with no work history or not enough quarters of work to qualify for SSDI, the least valued disabled members of society. It would not accurately describe the depth of poverty faced by those on disability benefits, however, without explaining that the current system of measuring poverty dates back to the 1960s. Government has never adjusted the equation to take into account the sharp rise in housing medical care and child care costs of the following four decades that have altered the average household's economic picture. The Urban Institute concluded that in order to be comparable to the original threshold, the poverty level would have to be at least 50% higher than the current official standard. If basic needs were refigured to the modern market, almost a quarter of the American people would be deemed to be living in poverty. Most important public policy that equates disablement with poverty means that becoming disabled, a non-worker, translates into a life of financial hardship, whether one has public insurance or not, and generates a very realistic fear in workers of becoming disabled. At base, the inadequate safety net is a product of the owning class's fear of losing control of the means of production. The all-encompassing value placed on work is necessary to produce wealth. The American work ethic is a mechanism of social control that ensures capitalists of a reliable workforce for making profits. If workers were provided with a federal social safety net that adequately protected them through unemployment, sickness, disability, and old age, then business would have less control over the workforce because labor would gain a stronger, stronger position from which to negotiate their conditions of employment such as fair wages and safe working conditions. American business retains its power over the working class through a fear of destitution that would be weakened if the safety net were to actually become safe. This in turn causes oppression for the less valued non-working disabled members of our society, those who do not provide a body to support profit making for whatever reason are relegated to economic hardship or institutionalized. to shore up the capitalist system. Nursing homes, for instance, have commodified disabled bodies so that the least productive can be made to use, can be made of use to the economic order. Disabled persons contribute to the gross domestic product when occupying a bed in an institution where they generate $30,000 to $82,000 in annual revenues and contribute to a company's net worth. Commodification is a root of institutional oppression. A materialist analysis suggests that capitalism has created a powerful class of persons dependent upon the productive labor of some and the exclusion of others. Business owners and Wall Street investors rely on the preservation of the status quo labor system, not having to absorb the non-standard costs disabled workers represent in the current mode of production or the reserve army of unemployed. Judge Posner's quote earlier explains the calculus. The U.S. work-based, needs-based system is a socially legitimized means by which business and investors can economically discriminate and morally shift the cost of disabled workers onto poverty-based government benefit programs rather than be required to hire or retain the unemployables as members of the mainstream workforce. Consequently, disabled individuals currently not in the workforce collecting SSDI or SSI who could work with an accommodation are not tallied into employers' cost of doing business. Employers do not pay direct premiums for social security disab disability programs. The cost of direct government and private payments to support disabled persons of employable age who do not have a job is estimated to be $232 billion annually. Instead, disabled persons have no right to a job. Civil rights laws do not intervene in the labor market to mandate employment of disabled persons, not even to adhere to affirmative action, much less to a quota system like Germany's.
Rather, these costs are shifted onto the shoulders of the working class and the low middle class who pay the majority of social security taxes, while business in our economic system is absolved of responsibility. This analysis is not suggesting that benefits be dissolved. Employment discrimination is related to radiance or to reliance on public aid because those who experience labor market discrimination are also more likely to need public assistance. It does suggest that capitalism is a system that forces non-disabled persons into the labor market, but also just as forcefully coerces many disabled persons out. Oppression occurs in either case. Lingering questions. A Marxian analysis demonstrates that the employment predicament of disabled persons is produced by the economic and social forces of capitalism. The mode of production is key to explaining the organization of society, to preserving existing class relations of production. It is neither arbitrary nor irrational that disabled persons have been excluded from education, transportation, and other social spheres. Rather, it is logical that such a state of affairs would exist as long as disabled persons have little value as workers to the, capital, uh, to the capitalist class. The civil rights model holds that disabled persons need the protections afforded by the ADA to help shrink the pervasive gaps that still exist between them and non-disabled Americans. This equal opportunity approach, however, assumes that the employment needs of disabled people can be solved under our present economic system. Liberal, anas liberal analysis fails to inform that civil rights law, even if enforced and successful, only have the power to redistribute the maladies of unemployment, poverty, and oppression, not to ensure that every person's material needs are met. The economy dictates that large numbers of the disabled population will be left jobless or working at sub-minimum wages, regardless of disability civil rights laws. Is this acceptable? Is the disability rights movement's goal only to see that some, not even all, disabled persons are free to be boldly exploited like everyone else? Liberalism presumes a free, rational, autonomous human can exist under capitalism but oppression is a permanent factor of any class-based economic system. Marx saw capitalism as a block of workers' autonomy. Economic change, he deemed, was necessary for the full realization of each person's human potential. Marx's final goal, however, was not economic revolution, but human change. Eric Fromm points out that the goal of Marx's atheistic radical humanism was the salvation of man, his self-actualization, the overcoming of the craving for having and consumption, his freedom and independence, and his love for others. Marx believed that individual autonomy is interwoven with and dependent upon social relations. Okay. Labor power is something that must be created and controlled in a manner appropriate to the maintenance of the capitalist social relation. Exploitation is a common feature of all modes of production that are split into classes. Alienation is a consequence of the mercantilization of human life as a whole by the capitalist relations of production. Wage labor is the transformation of human energy into a commodity like any other piece of matter. So, if the masses were to have freedom and autonomy, Marx believed there must be a transformation of alienated, meaningless labor into productive, free labor, not simply employment or employment at higher wages, but a private or state capitalism, or by a private, fuck, <laughs> that changes the sentence dramatically, uh, at higher wages by a private or state capitalism. In our society, humane concerns are subsumed by the market's tyranny, the inversion or camera obscura of what is needed to foster an inclusive, cooperative, and healthy society. Questions that need to be brought to the forefront might include the following. What is the purpose of an economy for, for to support market drive profits or to sustain social bonds and encourage human participation? Is it acceptable to reduce the productive activities of persons to commodity wage labor? Is the capacity to produce for profit an acceptable measure of human worth? Uh, 
Is it defensible to hold in contempt bodies that do not produce the way the capitalist class demands, leaving disabled persons to struggle on low wages or meager benefits? Or benefit checks? Or to be institutionalized? How can the realm of work be reorganized to provide accommodations for all? And how can all members of society be embraced and rewarded whether they work or not? The disability rights independent living liberation struggle provides a strong motive for historical change. There is an opportunity to reconceptualize disability and to eliminate disabled people's oppression. We must contest the biological rationale for the exclusion of disabled persons from the realm of work and replace it with a materialistic rationale calling for drastically and justly altering the political economy. The fundamental questions of class power raised by Marx must be addressed politically if the long-term goal of a society of equals, where from each according to his disabilities to each according to his need, is to materialize.